Welcome back to the Student Hub Live STEM Showcase. In this session, we take a look at environment, earth and ecosystems. And I'm joined by Philip Wheeler, um, who is a, a senior lecturer and has been doing some of the incredible field work um, activities that OU students can uh, engage with as part of their studies. We've been taking a look at labs, but field work sounds a lot more exciting. I don't know if it's more exciting, ah. Karen, but, but, but definitely for uh, the environmental and earth sciences, it's really important. Yeah. Um, to, to study the environment out in the environment. And, uh, uh, and so, so actually getting out is, uh, is extremely important to um, uh, environmental scientists, earth scientists, and students studying those disciplines. That must involve a huge range of skill sets to, to go out, as you say, and look at various different things. I mean, there's so much you could look at. What sort of skills are important, and, and how do you incorporate that when you're designing some of the fieldwork activities? Well, the, the um, the, the tricky thing with fieldwork is that you're trying to be a scientist as you are in a lab, but usually you're not wearing a white coat okay. and you don't have lots of controlled conditions around you. The, the, the world is extremely variable and that's one of the things that makes it so interesting. Mm. Um, uh, so what you've got to do is approach that very variable world in the same way as you do in the lab and try and sort of filter out all the noise and that variability. Uh, um, to focus on the scientific question. So that, that sort of set of skills that field scientists tend to have are actually sort of very useful skills generally. People who can be very practical, uh, think on their feet, um, uh, come across challenging or new situations and, uh, and deal with those. And they're the sorts of skills that I suppose are uh, pretty useful for people beyond science. Yeah, absolutely. In everyday life, being flexible and, and able to adapt is really, really important. Mm. How does that happen then on field trips? What's been your latest experience where, you, where you've been in a situation where it hasn't gone as you'd planned and you sort of think, actually, we're going to have to be really agile here in how we think? Well, um, I suppose the, the, the biggest variable, particularly working in this country, is the weather. Mm. Um, so you can very often turn up to a site um, somewhere that you've been for several years and it just looks completely different. So we take students on the environmental science module at level two, S206, um, and they study hydrology, so the way that water moves across the landscape. And of course, this year, I'm about to go out on, uh, on Sunday, actually, to, to study with a group of students in Shropshire. I've no idea what we're going to find. Um, uh, probably not very much in terms of water in rivers. And, uh, uh, and of course, that has big effects, not just on how the rivers look, but also on the vegetation that's growing and all those sorts of things. So, so uh, being able to adapt, maybe finding new sites or, or, or just asking different questions that are relevant to what you see in front of you, that's, that's the sort of key. Now, you say going out on Sunday with lots of students. You have to tell us what, what that involves. Which students? What are they going to be doing? Well, so, so there's uh, loads of opportunities for students to do practical field work in the earth and environmental sciences. So, so uh, S209 students studying earth science and S206 students studying environmental science can do residential field schools. So that's one of the courses that I'll be taking on Sunday. Um, and, uh, and we're going to Shropshire, but there's other courses all around the country. And um, uh, they'll be studying particularly vegetation and soils, actually, uh, um, in Shropshire. So, so we're going to show them the, the sort of standard methodologies for, for doing assessments of vegetation. And those are the sorts of things that environmental managers, conservationists use to assess whether sites are changing, whether they're improving or not. So I guess if you think of stuff that's in the news at the moment, those um, big fires on Saddleworth mm -hmm. Moor uh, um, near Manchester, um, uh, when all the fires have stopped and everything has settled down, there's going to be a big issue there looking at the change in vegetation, the recovery of the vegetation after the fire, and, and the sorts of skills that we'll be teaching students on these residential courses will be the sorts of skills that the professionals who are monitoring that change will be using. Brilliant. Now we've got a video of a field cast. Um, tell us what students are going to see on this video. Okay, so, so um, practical field work, um, being out in the field is one thing, but uh, um, some of the important skills around field work aren't just about being out in the field, they're about coping with that uncertainty. And, so, so, and not everybody can get into the field, not every, everybody can do residential courses, for example. Um, uh, and so uh, we uh, wanted to bring students into contact with field work and get them to understand some of the, the, those sort of more generic field work skills. Um, uh, and we did it, uh, we've, we've done it in the sort of form of um, uh, a live interactive broadcast. So we call those field casts. And what students do there is that they basically direct three academics, and we're out in a field on, on campus, and, um, and they tell us more or less what to do. So they choose their path through an investigation. Uh, and um, 
uh, yeah, I, I guess that's that's what we're going to see. Well, shall we have a look at the video? And we're going to keep the sound up so that if you want to talk through it, we can uh, do that. OK. Brilliant. Hello, good day, welcome, good evening. I'm so pleased you could join us tonight on the Open University campus. We're here in this Ridge and Furrow um, meadow that we're lucky enough to have on campus. And over the next three evenings, Monday, okay, Wednesday so, and Friday, so we're going to be taking you through the process of an ecological left to right, investigation. Uh, is Cadmium Masic and then Julia Cook and myself. And we're three ecologists in the School of Environment, Earth and Ecosystem Sciences. And um, so here we're uh, showing, in, introducing students to this site, which is an ancient species-rich meadow just on the OU campus. Uh, and so students are using the same um, platform that, that uh, folks are, uh, are viewing this uh, Student Hub Live event on. Um, but uh, um, answering questions, there's a little bit of prattling about involved and, uh, uh, and larking about in the field. Uh, and, uh, and so students are, are using the sorts of widgets that the students watching today have in front of them to direct us um, through the whole investigation actually to decide what we're going to study. Here we're looking at the, uh, the variety of plant species um, uh, on the site and comparing it to um, small scale changes in the topography which might relate to the wetness of the soil or the amount of organic matter or all sorts of other things in the soil. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so, 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 so that's us uh, doing that. We do it over the course of uh, three nights, um, usually in the well, spring. The it's a Captain Sparrow walk compulsory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's extremely important to make sure that your pacing is very regular. So, um, yeah, that was, that, was, <laughs> that was my strategy for doing that. <laughs> Brilliant. So we've looked at two, two different options. You've told us about the residential events that students can go to and also the way that they can do that if they can't get out to residential events. But what about if students want to direct their own learning? Um, a really good question. And, and actually, uh, an important part of fieldwork is, is giving students the opportunity to, to learn um, with the academics. So, so a great thing is that as an academic, as a, a researcher, you don't know what you're going to find. And so the students don't know what they're going to find. So you're kind of working in partnership rather than uh, teaching. So, so um, uh, students can uh, take that on themselves and um, in several courses at level two and three they have the opportunity to carry out their own research project that they can, um, they can uh, write themselves uh, de or design themselves and carry out themselves. Um, and we've also got an, uh, a range of other ways that students can get their own data from things that we've set up. So, so these are the virtual field trips, are they? Yeah, uh, so, so the, there's a, um, uh, a virtual field trip for earth science students based around the Lake District Mountain Skiddaw. Wow. And students basically go in in a, a kind of virtual reality world and they can fly around the landscape, they can stop down and look in detail at, uh, at the rocks and carry out activities that are very similar to what they would do in actual reality. Wow, excellent. So uh, let's take a trick, quick trip to Darren and see how everyone is doing back home before we continue. Darren. I, I, just to say that I think people are quite enthusiastic about field trips and, and even if it is chucking it down with rain, it's an absolutely great experience. Mm -hmm. So um, pe people are very happy about those. It's, uh, there, was, there were students in North Yorkshire this year um, who were supposed to be doing field work and it was when the beast from the east came <gasps> in. And um, yeah, there was there was sort of four inches of snow on the ground but I, by all accounts that they kept the spirits up and it, it's a great thing because it's a really good social occasion as well for students to meet each other and share ideas. That's formed lifelong friendships after an experience like yeah, that. Yeah I, I certainly did when I was a student doing field work and I think the OU students are the same. Yeah so many students have said oh you know we miss residential schools etc where they've been replaced by other you know ways of teaching but um, no a very very practical innovative way of doing things. Okay um, so you've also um, uh, using technology to get some real data as well where students can access it. So you've mentioned the Lake District and that's more of a sort of virtual reality experience, mm. isn't it? Um, but we also use technology with real data. So tell us about how that works. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I was just uh, um, uh, what, uh, watching, listening to, to the uh, colleagues talking about the, the telescopes and yeah. thinking uh, 20 years ago when I was a student, I, I remember having to fax people to organise going to, to field work and how far we've moved. Yeah. So the internet has really revolutionised the way we can access information, access data. And one of the things that my, Cadmiel, uh, uh, my colleague Cadmiel Masic uh, has done is uh, set up a, 
uh, a tree linked to the internet and I think in a little while we're going to have a, a look at that aren't we and um, so, so, so that tree has got sensors in it that's broadcasting in real time uh, to the internet so anybody can have a look and students on the terrestrial ecosystems course that's being written at the moment uh, for start in October um, are going to be able to tap into those data as part of the activities on that course. It's a really incredible. Well, let's take a look at this tree. Eleni's by the tree, which is on campus. Eleni, it's a lovely sunny day out there. How are you? Hello, it's lovely, isn't it? It's absolutely beautiful. And I'm stood here next to this amazing ash tree. Can you so tell us about the tweeting tree. Okay, so we are looking at a number of instruments that are measuring changes in both the diameter of the tree, but also the water use of the tree. So if we come in and have a look, what we have on the left here, visual, this is called the dendrometer. This is measuring fluctuations in pressure. So it's measuring the tree expands and contracts and that diameter is changing. And that happens cyclically um, over evaporated from the leaves, a process called transpiration. The trunk is actually shrinking during the day and then in the night that's being replenished so the tree is, trunk is growing um, as we take up water through the roots. On the right hand side here we have three probes that are drilled a couple of centimeters into the trunk and they're actually measuring the flow of water both up from the ground from the roots uh, the, um, all of this is being fed into this little box here um, and what's actually missing this data to the website where anybody can go and look out going. Well, this is um, pretty much live and real and it's really important for the process of photosynthesis uh, which is linking into the carbon cycle, the water cycle and how the bias is there. But if we have a bit of time, we actually have some live science going on over here too. We have spotted Julia out in the field doing some research. So Julia, a little bit about the experiment that's going on just behind us now. I, um, well, so I'm making some measurements on behalf of my PhD student who's working on bee orchids, and we're lucky enough to have some. So um, I'm just running a pump collecting task for her today. That's super. Could you just give us a, an idea of how all of this research that's going on on, on campus to the curriculum? Well, so many ecologists are active researchers, and so we do to show our research to, to the students. So Kadmi Masek, who set up tree that you were just looking at, um, he's an expert on sort of plant water relations and, and uh, the exchange with grasses, atmosphere, and so um, this links to history and will feed into terrestrial ecosystems. And I can I was just having a look at the data line from the tree. Uh, it's expanding by millimetres, ripping up sort of parts of millimetres of change in the day. Um, and, and our research feeds into course material too. I think people who have been studying S112, for example, will have seen some of my research and some of their taking it further activities. So, yeah, our research feeds directly into teaching. That's fantastic. And as I said before, what the tree is doing. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Julia. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Eleni. So much happening at the Open University, yeah, well, especially today. I feel a bit miffed I'm inside now. <laughs> but listen, tell us about this tree because this is incredible. Um, and we've got a slide that we can um, show everyone at home um, where they can access this data. Um, so we've got treewatch.net, you can see here. Talk us through how this all works. Okay, so, so it's part of a wider citizen science project. Um, that's uh, um, uh, in, in conjunction with the universities on the mainland Europe. Um, and, uh, and essentially, the equipment that you've seen on our tree at the OU is replicated at these other sites. Uh, and, and basically, the, the, those very detailed measurements that are being collected by those instruments are being broadcast in almost real time uh, to, uh, to the internet, and uh, and that's it really. So, so I think we can see. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we can see. We the, can the see other, a picture of the sapling, can't image. we? Yeah. So, 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 um, uh, so what you can see there are um, s uh, data with the, the sort of blue bit of that plot showing the sap flow. So it's when the sun comes up, as Alan was saying, um, the the tree starts photosynthesizing, water starts moving up and out through the leaves, and so that's measuring the the flow of that water through the trunk. 
And then the orange lines, um, there are uh, the, uh, um, the, the growth that, and uh, a bit like people uh, grow when they're sleeping, apparently. I mean, my brother is short and slept a lot <laughs> today. I'm not quite sure about that, but um, uh, yeah, the, uh, so, so trees uh, grow at night time and then as the water sort of used in the leaves they, they kind of shrink and then incrementally grow up and up and up like that. So, um, so, so that's what that's showing on, on really kind of um, uh, well hundreds of microns so, so I'll get myself in trouble here hundredths of a millimeter sort of scale and that's that's what those instruments are doing. Wow. The, yeah the, the amazing thing is as, as Julia and, and Eleni were saying there that those very fine measurements can be used then to understand how the physiology of trees relates to the climate mm. not just how the climate affects the physiology but also how trees affect um, uh, uh, the global climate so we can start to build models of what trees do based mm. on these very detailed data and scale those up to understand global processes so how trees like that affect uh, climate change for example and that's some of the research work that is being taken from this network of trees and, and being applied to those big scale global questions. Brilliant. Now this is not the only tree of its kind. It isn't, no. There, there are several trees networked uh, like this, as I say, uh, um, uh, in, in different sites uh, across Europe. And uh, if students go to the Tree Watch Net site, they'll, they'll be able to see details of those as well. Um, we've got other projects involving trees at the OU as well. So, so we, um, uh, um, uh, we're kind of giving students an opportunity and the wider public an opportunity to interact with uh, trees and understand more about trees because they're, they're really kind of important parts of our environment and particularly in urban environments. So we uh, have started a, a, a big project um, that's aiming to map urban trees across the UK and that's called Treezilla, the monster map of trees. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a name that makes people laugh but you don't forget it. No. Um, and uh, and it's, yeah, so, so, so trees doing all those things that they do, taking up water um, and, uh, and photosynthesizing, all that sort of stuff, carry out uh, a very uh, important set of processes. So, so they reduce the risk of floods because they allow water to penetrate in the soil and they distribute it back into the canopies, they store carbon dioxide, uh, they take pollution out of the air and, and those processes are useful to people, they, they have a value to us and so we call those in the kind of jargon term ecosystem services. And using the sorts of data that you've seen from our tweeting tree, uh, we can calculate the amounts of those ecosystem services that trees of different sizes and different species can uh, produce and link in, for example, the cost of pollution. You know, we know pollution makes people sick and that has a cost. So joining the dots between those different points allows us to estimate a value for the, the ecosystem services that each tree provides. So the Treezilla project is really about getting people to understand that and to collect the data that allow us to understand how urban trees provide all these services and what the value, the economic value of those services is. So at the moment we have over 800,000 trees mapped which are um, uh, estimated to be worth uh, tens of millions of pounds per year to society simply by the processes that they're just carrying on doing as part of their daily routine. Now, you've mentioned citizen science and this is a, an increasingly important way of collecting data and a way for everyone to be a scientist. And also you've mentioned that the, the tree, for example, is tweeting. What is the value of things in the public domain and the value of allowing anybody to contribute in terms of what they see or experience or, or have access to data? Um, it, it's extremely valuable. I mean, part of our mission is, is to teach society, isn't it? Uh, um, uh, and, and to make sure society is better informed. So, so providing people generally with that information is really kind of part of our mission. It's a good thing to do. It also gives our students um, who get access to not only the citizen science projects, but, but also kind of direction as to how to use them to ask scientific questions. It gives them access to massive amounts of data that allow them to answer, ask questions that they wouldn't otherwise be able to. You couldn't, on your own, collect 800,000 tree records. Um, but students on the, uh, the new environment module, SDT 306, at, at uh, level three, are going to be able to collate data from several hundred students about trees using the Treezilla project. And we've just put a link to that in the chat, so if you're watching now, you can uh, click on that link, and Darren will also put a link into TreeWatch also. And we'll put those on the Student Hub Live resources page, where you'll find that and many other resources to do with this session that you can check out later. 
Sounds incredibly exciting. So what's the next big thing then in terms of earth environment and ecosystems? Well, we've got two new modules coming online in October and, uh, and they're going to be really exciting because they use some of these technologies to allow students to really participate and, um, uh, and actively participate and particularly that thing about learning to become researchers themselves which is as an academic that's the really exciting thing that field work gives you it gives you the opportunity to to start your students being researchers to think like scientists themselves and here's the challenge can you remember the module name or code <laughs> i can so s397 is uh, terrestrial ecosystems and sdt306 is environment responding to change brilliant so those are th first out this October, so students can take a look at those now. That's right, and that's in addition to the second level modules S206, Environmental Science, and S209, Earth Sciences. Brilliant. That's incredible. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing with us uh, and showing us the tree, Philip. Um, that's been absolutely brilliant. Um, we're going to take a look at one of the um, most amazing field trips ever before we come back and look at engineering and innovation. So enjoy this next video, and I'll see you after the break.